in part two of lesson nine, we want to look at a little bit more detail as to how a protostar becomes a main sequence star. And protostars often, due to the conservation of angular momentum, are spinning and create strong magnetic fields. And charged particles will be ejected um, along the poles about which it is spinning and form big knots of gas. Um, a lot of the charged particles then being ex ejected into these huge areas of gas cause them to glow. And these glowing knots of gas are called herbig haro objects. And a protostar may lose more of its mass to these objects than what is found remaining in the final star. So as these stars are spinning, um, there's some motion to the gas, and as the gas collapse, conservation of angular momentum will cause these to spin. And these spinning protostars will develop disks around them, and due to friction, most of the gas and dust will be accreted into this disk. And this accretion disk going around the star will then rain material down onto the star. And it also helps carry away some of the angular momentum um, due to particles being ejected into space. And this helps slow the protostar's rotation down so it would be that of a normal star. Um, here, some of the protoplanetary or some of the accretion disk may be left, and the part of the disk that is left can form planets. So here, um, after the protostar becomes a main sequence star, um, the disk becomes a little bit more stable and starts to clump together, and those clumps form planets. And we are finding that this is probably not an exception to the rule. This is probably something that's very common. Very large stars that have a large solar wind may blow away their accretion disks. And some of the binary systems may have gravitational problems that prevent um, planets from forming. But we're finding a lot more planets than you may expect. The dark nebula that form young stars um, are very, very large, and they tend to form many stars at a time. And the cluster, or the large nebula, will tend to clump. And each one of these clumps may become a young star with a wide variety of different masses. Now, large stars will reach a main sequence before the smaller stars. And they will start to produce an intense ultraviolet radiation. And this ionizes and heats the surrounding medium, which then glows in what we call an H2 region. Visible to the naked eye, only 1,500 light years from Earth, the Great Orion Nebula has been known and revered since ancient times. A popular target of Hubble, researchers have now identified 42 new disks within it that could be the beginnings of new planetary systems like our own. In the sword, just under the belt in the constellation of Orion the Hunter, is the majestic Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is one of the best known examples of a star forming nebula, a swirling cloud of gas and dust where stars begin their journey of life. Now, in the early 1990s, astronomers discovered so called proplets in Orion using Hubble. A proplet is a protoplanetary disk, and it forms along with a newborn star in a spinning mixture of gas and dust. At the center, you have the star forming, and around it, bits of dust clump together to form a disk. Essentially, proplets are thought to be young planetary systems in the making. One of the first targets of astronomers after telescopes were invented in the 17th century, the Orion Nebula was also the first nebula ever photographed, over a hundred years ago by the American astronomer Henry Draper, a pioneer in astrophotography. His photograph, taken in 1880, represents a milestone in the history of astronomy. Now the beauty of the Orion Nebula is not its only draw. Astronomers are interested in it because it is one of the nearest star-forming regions to Earth with stars that are massive enough to heat up the surrounding gas, making it glow. This fascinating object has been a favorite target of Hubble's from very early on in the observatory's lifetime. The sharpest image ever taken of the Orion Nebula was released in 2006. This image from Hubble's advanced camera for surveys shows more than 3,000 stars of various sizes, some of which had never before been seen in visible light. Now looking at the frenzied mixture of gas and swirling dust, it's pretty clear that a lot is going on inside the Orion Nebula. 
Within the awe-inspiring gaseous folds of Orion, researchers using data from the Widefield Channel on Hubble's advanced camera for surveys have identified two different types of disks. The ones that lie close to the brightest star in the cluster, Theta-1 Orionis C, and those farther away from it. The star affects the nearby disks by heating up the gas within them, causing them to shine brightly. The excited material produces many glowing cusps, which all face the bright star and are thus randomly oriented within the nebula. Other interesting features enhance the looks of these captivating objects, such as jets of matter flowing away and shock waves. The dramatic shock waves are formed when the stellar wind from the nearby massive star meets the gas in the nebula, producing interesting shapes. They sometimes appear like boomerangs or arrows, and in the case of 181825, the shockwave makes appropriate looks like a space jellyfish. The disks that are farther away do not receive enough energetic radiation from the star to set the gas ablaze. That's why these disks can only be detected as a dark silhouette against the bright background of the nebula. The dust in the disk simply absorbs the light from the background. It is in these silhouette disks that astronomers are better able to study the properties of dust grains, which are thought to clump together and possibly form planets like our own. The bright star that illuminates some of the propylids, allowing us to see them, is both a blessing and a curse. The powerful radiation that lights them up also threatens their very existence, as the disk material, once heated up, is very likely to dissipate and dissolve, destroying their potential to become planets. Some of the bright propylids are doomed to be torn apart, but others will survive and perhaps evolve into planetary systems. It is relatively rare to see images of proplets in visible light. However, the resolution and sensitivity of Hubble, combined with the Orion Nebula's proximity to Earth, allow for an excellent view of these fascinating objects. Although proplets may appear to be only humble smudges, some of them are in fact the seeds of solar systems to come. Here we have a picture of the Eagle Nebula, and you see three large pillars um, that are dark nebulae, and off to the top right, there are some young, very large stars, and the solar wind from these stars is blowing away the top of the pillars of the dark nebula, and in doing so, it's exposing some young stars. And these young stars are also getting their accretion disks blown away, so they'll never quite reach their full potential size. So, when I look in the galaxy, where would I expect to find um, star formation? And in the galaxies, there's huge clouds of H2 and carbon dioxide, and these clouds are called giant molecular clouds, and they could have a million solar masses um, that can be enormously large, 300 light years across, and they have very high density. They have 200 atoms per cubic centimeter. That's about 10,000 times more dense than the rest of space. So in the densest of these clouds is where we find our dark nebula, and that's where we find our star formation. Now, if you look at the spiral of our galaxy, um, most of these large molecular clouds or giant molecular clouds are in the arms of the spiral. The arms of the spiral are where mass piles up. It's kind of like a cosmic traffic jam. And as the spirals go through these clouds, um, they can compress the cloud and trigger more star formation. So, some of the, as stars are formed, some of the larger stars um, produce strong solar wind and they tend to carve out holes in the molecular cloud. Um, the H2 region, or the H2 around um, these regions, are heated by the ultraviolet radiation, and it causes the cavity to expand. In this case, the stellar winds are moving faster than the speed of sound through the gas. And just like a jet plane, it produces a supersonic boom, and the supersonic boom acts like a shock wave. The shock wave can cause density regions um, within the cloud, and these shock waves can also not only eat away the cloud, but they can trigger further star formation through the shock wave. So another event that can cause star formation, um, cause the cloud to get more dense and start forming protostars, are supernovae, which we'll study in a couple chapters. And supernovae are at the end of a star's life, 
a very massive star will die a very violent death and it will literally explode and produce massive amounts of material that move out at several thousand kilometers per second. And this will also in reach the vicinity of a molecular cloud or a giant molecular cloud causing compression and further star formation. So the collapse of a star into a supernova only takes a few hundreds of a milliseconds and the mass ejection in this time forms a thin wall of gas that expands at a speed greater than 300 kilometers per second. As that gas slams into the interstellar medium it heats it and compresses it and that cloud then can form star formation. So our sun um, we can look at the chemical composition of our sun. We know it's not one of the earliest stars. Um, it has 2% heavier metals, just like the interstellar space. And there's strong evidence that it is created in a supernovae remnant. So the gas that was produced in a supernova helped form our own star. So that was lesson nine. Um, let me know if you have any questions. NASA has been orbiting the Hubble Space Telescope for long enough now that we're able to do time-lapse images and this is an event that still puzzles astronomers but you can see the outflow of gas from the event from this star over the course of four years of observation and <clears throat> as that gas expands it could be triggering in the molecular cloud more star formation through the shock wave and the motion of this gas from around this star. Well, in this lesson, we looked at star formation, and we found that stars are formed um, within dark nebula that exist within giant molecular clouds. Um, it's a constant battle between pressure and gravity in the formation of the star, and that the young stars and the process of being formed are called protodisks. And as we'll find with everything in the life of a star, the larger a star is, the faster things occur. So the smaller stars can take billions of years to form, where the largest of stars can take hundreds of thousands of years to form. So if you have any questions, give me a call or send me an email, and I'll be glad to help you out.